See this? This steep rise in elevation? This annoys me. It's annoyed me for years. Why is there such a marked and sudden uplift in this area? What caused this to occur? And why is the direction of it opposite to the typical east to west facing fault systems in Victoria? These were some of the many questions I asked when I first came across this strange geological oddity. But I think I've finally figured it out. And if I'm correct, the implications of it are massive in more ways than one. This is going to be part one of a series that I'll be making as I attempt to solve, or at the very least, gain a greater insight into the burning questions I've had for years surrounding the geology of the Ballarat and Creswick region. This story begins with my attempts to decipher a weird geological oddity at Black Hill, which I will delve into in greater detail in a coming video. But essentially, everything began with this point here. This fault, this horizontal line that breaks apart in this section, is something that stood out as unbelievably strange to me when I saw it many years ago. In Victoria, one would expect to see the typical east to west facing faults as a result of the state being formed by multiple subduction events over time that dipped underneath the west from the east, thrusting the land up out of the deep ocean in the process. This is what some of them look like. But now we have this, this horizontal fault. Years ago, I remember looking at this and shouting, why? Why do you exist? And this lack of understanding would plague me for years. I would wake up at night, soaked in sweat, where I would then proceed to get up, walk to my window, put one hand on the glass and whisper, Black Hill, until my missus told me to shut up and get back to bed, to which I begrudgingly obliged. In all seriousness though, this fault here is the start of our story, and this story will span beyond this episode. I'm setting the scene for the next few videos, and in one of them, I'm going to reveal the location of a gold-rich line of reef that was sought after for years, but was never found. Yes, you heard that right, I'm going to show you exactly where it is. The knowledge associated with it will be a revelation to literally every prospector or geology enthusiast in Victoria. But to get into it, something pushed this part of the land up by between 40 to 50 metres. This is weird. On top of that, we have a break in the fault, meaning something exerted so much force in this area that it literally snapped this fault in two. And this is the first clue. The second is, well, obvious. Why is this scarp slope so pronounced? If Australia was an earthquake prone area, I wouldn't be so baffled. But since we get minute ones at best, with us only very rarely experiencing major events, although they still do occur, but they aren't common enough to explain what we are seeing here. So this escarpment isn't formed by a traditional earthquake, and it's not formed by the erosion of soft rocks versus more erosion resistant ones either because this is all ancient sedimentary bedrock from the Ordovician era, which was deposited during a time when Victoria was a deep ocean. So the rocks are little more than mudstone, siltstone, slate, sandstone, etc. There's no granitic outcrop or erosion resistant outcrop that's stopping the slope from being eroded. So what is it? Well, I think it's one of the many Horst and Graben sequences in Victoria. It's the only thing, in my eyes, that perfectly fits and explains this to a T, including the breakaway that's witnessed with this fault, which would occur if something was pushing against it in a northwestern direction. But if any geologists are studying this, I'd be interested to hear what you have to say. The rift event between Australia and Antarctica created the Horst and Graben phenomenon, which I've covered in past videos. One part of the land drops, and the other either elevates or remains static whilst the adjacent block drops. The outcome? Alternating sequences of highs and lows, varying in their level of spread. Some Horst and Grabens are short, others quite long, going for kilometres or more in certain cases. So when Australia and Antarctica separated, Victoria was faulted in a very unique way. For the first time in its history, it was faulted in a north direction. This knowledge is actually pretty new to us, so the implications of it are still being explored. But it explains why this fault snapped here. So let's take a look at the implications here. If the land I'm standing on when I took this video is a Graben, then the mountain range that Black Hill is a part of, which by the way is called the Brown Hill Range, would be a horse in this area. Brown Hill was originally a typical east to west facing mountain range, and it still is. But in this area, a north to northwest facing fault was added to it, 
And I believe that this is why this broke apart in a direction that lines up perfectly with what would happen if massive pressure was applied to it in a northwestern facing direction. In the preceding episodes, we're going to take a look at some pretty fascinating things. Firstly, I believe Black Hill was the site of the original river that predates even the deep leads that run from it. I know that might sound strange, but bear with me and try to keep an open mind because I promise my reasoning for thinking this is pretty damn sound. On top of this, like I mentioned before, I'm going to show you where a gold rich line of reef is located and I'm going to explain why the old timers missed it. And all of these topics tie into this video and I believe will explain the deep nature of the leads in Ballarat with the depth of shafts being ludicrous to say the least, especially when compared to the couple of feet that was required to reach bedrock in places just a little north from it, compared to the dozens or hundreds of feet required here. So this is episode one of what I consider to be a fascinating geological series with far-reaching implications. I hope you guys will join me on this journey of exploration and hypothesizing. Make sure to hit that subscribe button and click the bell icon to be notified of when it's uploaded. And as always, thanks for watching. This story is one that intimately ties the complex geology of Victoria with a section in a line of reef that was known to exist and was much sought after, but was ultimately never found. Much effort was placed in attempting to locate it, but the miners and geologists of the time didn't have one crucial piece of information that's required to decipher what is going on here. In this video, I'm going to attempt to solve the mystery of the missing southern section of the Temperance Reef, which was an insanely gold-rich vertical line of quartz that stretched over a long distance, and that, in present day, still exists beneath the feet of many who call Ballarat home, and I'm almost certain that I know exactly where it is. A few weeks ago, when we discovered a gold-bearing reef and started the GoFundMe, I mentioned in the video that I intended to give back to the community and to begin to release some game-changing info. The link to that video is in the description. Even though we never reached our end goal, I can't tell you how appreciative I am that people so generously donated to help us out. I'm a man of my word, so this episode will be one of many to follow that will consist of me walking my talk and sharing some of the most valuable and widely unknown information from the many years that I've spent being an obsessive geological nerd. This episode is technically part two to the video that I released yesterday regarding the strange escarpment that exists in this region, and it's worth watching that first before proceeding, as this is centered around this mountain range here, known as the Brown Hill Ranges. So bear with me and make sure you're subbed so that you are informed when I release these videos. Please do me a solid and hit that like button too. That's all I ask in return for the valuable information I'm going to share with you over the coming weeks and months beginning with this video. The Temperance Reef was, and still is, a highly mineralized gold rich line of quartz. It was deposited into the bedrock of Ballarat some 430 million years ago, give or take, during one of the numerous subduction events that occurred here. The part of the reef that was discovered is here and multiple companies worked it. But by far, the most renowned company was the Temperance Mine, which was the standout quartz mine in the area northeast of Ballarat, known as Narina today, or Little Bendigo in its heyday. The mine produced 1,530 kilograms of gold out of a total of 3,511 kilograms for the whole of that field, meaning they produced almost half of all the gold that came out of Little Bendigo slash Narina. But the richest mine that worked this reef was the Band of Hope, situated just a little north of Temperance, with them yielding an incredible two ounces of gold per tonne of crushed quartz, which is insanely rich. Temperance have a street named after them just a stone throws away from where this major mine once operated, and the shaft they used still exists to this day, this shaft was visibly open only a year or so ago, but blackberry vines have grown over it. Even with that, you wouldn't want to hop into this hole for reasons I'm about to mention. For well over 20 years, this company worked this reef down to the deepest depth out of any mine in Ballarat, with them approaching 1,000 feet in depth, or almost 305 meters, and the gold was damn good. But this story is less about the company and more about the mystery regarding why this reef suddenly disappeared from this point onwards. 
In the book The Astonishing History of Ballarat, Volume 3, the following line appears. The Temperance Reef was worked from about 1853 to 1893, when it was found that its continuity going south was broken by a cross course, beyond which, I believe, it was never traced. This cross course is what I will address in this video, but as you will see, multiple attempts were made to locate it. The first company that tried and failed was the Express Quartz Co, located here. The owner of this mine got into a conflict with the boys from Temperance, and was tarred and feathered in one instance after being beat up when attempting to literally encroach on their claim in the most disrespectful and forceful manner imaginable. He kinda deserved it. Eventually, the Express Quartz Company began operations, but soon failed and the claim and the mine was bought up by the Temperance Company to be reborn as the South Temperance Mine, after which the trail goes cold after 1875. It too had failed in locating the southern section of the Temperance Reef. Other attempts were made by these men to locate it, with two other shafts being sunk to the southwest of the South Temperance Mine, and they were also called South Temperance Mine, but again, nothing came of it. The last mine that attempted to intercept it was the Russell Square Co which worked ground post-1880s that was associated with the famous Eureka Deep Lead, roughly 30 years after it was discovered. Their intention was to reach this Deep Lead and two suspected tributaries, to get any of the alluvial gold that earlier miners missed. And along with this, they sought to find the missing Temperance Reef, and were expected to as well, with many people confident that this was exactly where it ran, and that the company would find it any day now. Well. They didn't, and you're going to find out why in a moment. This bit of knowledge that I'm going to share with you is a game changer, especially if you're a prospector or miner. But if you're like me, and you just love geology and the ability to interpret the land as much as I do, then this information is also essential to do that with any level of accuracy in Victoria. So whilst this concept is being applied to a very deep mine in this video, it's also applicable to shallow ground, and the implications of it are truly far reaching. This information, when appropriately applied, opens up a whole new world of prospectivity in this amazing state. The only thing that's stopping me from proving my hypothesis is the ability to legally sink a shaft to the required depth. Believe me, if I could do what the old fellas did and head to the store, buy some dynamite, peg out a claim and begin blasting, I'd be doing that right now to prove it. But the value in this isn't so much in the reef, at least it isn't for me. It's more in what the implications are regarding how it broke off from the main line, and how it got moved away from it. This information will probably interest the Ballarat Gold Mine, so if you guys decide to get a claim, just remember who gave you the info, and at least give me an infinite amount of free tours down there so I can nerd out on the geology. That's all I ask in return. Anyway, this explanation and the ultimate realisation that it provided to me regarding the location of the reef originally began with me attempting to decipher a weird geological oddity at Black Hill. Black Hill was a massive open cut gold mine. Low yielding, but odd in that because it was so extensively worked, it was mapped to perfection. But in the mapping, instead of seeing the typical east to west facing faults, which are to be expected in Victoria, as this entire state was more or less formed from subduction events that dipped underneath the west from the east, thrusting it up in the process. And yesterday's video touched on that, and it's definitely worth watching this video first, so that you can understand what I'm about to say in more detail. Basically, it appears to me that a Horst and Graben event altered this land in recent geological time. When the shafts were sunk to locate the missing Temperance Reef, this valuable bit of information was never taken into consideration. And as a result, the miners never sunk to the appropriate depth when they made their shafts. They sunk it to around the 60 to 90 meter mark. Not realizing that this part of the earth, known as a Graben, had sunk in recent geological history, whilst the area where they found the original reef was on top of a horst, an area of elevated land that had become uplifted. So whilst these sections of the reef were once joined, they had now broken apart, and the southern section of it became depressed along with the land, because it lost its buddy to the north, and there was no geological psychiatrist available back then. I mean, because the land it was located on sunk an additional god knows how many meters, and there's a chance it sheared off a little to the east or west. One thing to take into account is the rule of erosion that applies to uplifted sections of land. The higher it goes, the more pronounced erosion is, 
and the byproduct of this erosion was deposited on the depressed section of land, and eventually it was further buried by recent volcanic eruptions. But it's not only the fact that this southern section of the reef might be, at a guess, 200 metres deep, it's also the fact that erosion was more pronounced on the Horst section, meaning the temperance reef that was found and worked was sitting on a section of land that had eroded to a much more pronounced extent than the depressed block, so it's not even clear if this reef was outcropping when this land began to shift. The Express Quartz Co. stopped their sinking at a depth of 76 metres. They'd given up by this point. But really, they needed to sink an additional 100 metres, maybe a bit more, assuming they were sinking on the right location to begin with. And the fellas from the Temperance Mine made this same mistake in their other two shafts. They just didn't sink deep enough. So because of this, the implications are widespread, and they go far beyond just this point. Western Victoria is filled with numerous Horston Grabens. Many rivers were dried up by these events, and many others were sunk deep into the earth. The shallowest parts of the deep leads are located here, and the deepest in the Grabens. So right now, in present day, I'd be willing to bet an arm and a leg that the southern section of the Temperance Reef is deep underneath Ballarat East. And if you listen carefully, you can hear it mocking us for our futile attempts to locate it. Maybe one day we'll sink a shaft deep enough to reach it, and we can pay it back for its deception by blasting the hell out of it with explosives and crushing it into mere dust so that we can extract the value that lies therein. Or maybe it'll be spared the same grisly fate that the northern section of it experienced, beginning over 160 years ago. Thanks for watching. This is the final episode to wrap up the Black Hill series, and we're going to focus on the fascinating fact that this uplifted area was actually once the place where an ancient river flowed. This river preceded both the present-day Yarrowee River and the deep leads that would flow from Black Hill post-uplift in Ballarat, only to be covered by recent basaltic eruptions, leading to the birth of the Yarrowee River that flows through here today. If you go to the Yarrowee over here, it's not hard to realise that this river is actually pretty new, geologically speaking. It's small, and whilst it does widen out as it continues its journey south and then southeast towards Geelong, it's only between 4 to 7 million years old, which compared to the deep leads that preceded it is very young. Because before this river, we had several older and much larger rivers that flowed south from this area. These rivers began their life during the Horst and Graben events that Ballarat would inevitably experience as a result of the split that occurred between Antarctica and Australia which led to this part of the land becoming uplifted whilst the adjacent block sunk, forming new horizontal faults in a landscape that previously never contained anything remotely resembling these. This fascinates me immensely. I believe the reason why the Ballarat, and more notably the Creswick region, had the most pronounced recent volcanic activity occurring are because these areas are located at the very top of the Great Dividing Range in this region, essentially acting like a pinch point forming much larger and more pronounced faults than what can be seen in the surrounding areas. Whilst the majority of the western and middle parts of the state are volcanic, this region has some of the most eye-catching volcanic features, especially in the Creswick region. This means that, prior to the split of Antarctica, this area here was level. There was no uplifted and depressed region like there exists today, and it's possible that this uplift is actually still occurring to a very minute extent. So before the immensely gold-rich deep leads that would flow from Black Hill, Black Hill was the site of an ancient river. At least it was in the southwestern part of it, right here, where this split in the fault occurred. How do I know this? Well, physical evidence to my surprise does still exist, even with the Black Hill Mining Company's pronounced activity of literally pulverizing so much of the quartz that once existed here into dust to extract the gold contained therein, that literal ravines and chasms were created inside a once somewhat typical looking hill. But we have this incredible account, which was probably nothing more than a fleeting observation to the person who wrote it, and he wouldn't have had any idea that over 170 years later some dude would be making a YouTube video about it and noting just how important this lad's observation actually was. This is what he wrote on October the 31st in 1851, which was the year the gold rush began in Victoria. The Black Hill is a particularly interesting geological feature, 
A spiral ridge of rocks appears on the southwest face, exposing a vein of quartz of great thickness, penetrating clay slate. Nearer to summit is found steatite, greenstone, and mica slate. These again are found at a point in the form of clays and breccias. The quartz, though existing in masses of perhaps a ton in weight, is invariably rounded and waterworn, and in its position generally affording undeniable evidence of an aqueous deposit. This observation didn't make sense to me in my formative years when geology was just beginning to take a grasp on my every waking moment, but I revisited it recently whilst attempting to understand and ascertain how pronounced the Horst and Graben events in Victoria actually were, and a light bulb moment went off in my mind, which obviously blew my mind and has led to this series. The aqueous deposit was what remained after eons of river action occurred here. And I can tell you right now that I'd do anything to go back to this day in 1851 and see it with my own eyes. This tells me that this section here in Black Hill was the river, and that means that post uplift the river gravels and associated deposits began to flow downhill to become deposited within the deep leads that would invariably take the place of the ancient river that was now slowly, inch by inch, turning from a river into a hill and drying up with each passing year. In my eyes, this explains why the gravel pits deep lead existed. The gravel pits has always been a weird geological oddity to me. Why is this deep lead literally filled with so many feet worth of gravel? Why aren't other ones the same? What makes it different to the other leads? Where did all this gravel come from and why is it here? Well, I think that this is the best possible explanation for it. It's still not obvious to me whether or not it flowed north to the Murray or south to southeast towards the sea, but if I was to guess, I'd say it was vertical through this break in the fault, and that would make sense considering the mining activity that has occurred here. But I truly do believe this explains the gravel pits, as once Black Hill began to be uplifted, everything began to flow down into the newly forming deep leads that took the place of this ancient river, and as you can see, quite a few did. On geological maps, no areas list any deep leads beginning here, yet when we go here we can see alluvial work was definitely done, and the miners, perhaps unknowingly, mined what they thought was nothing more than a simple drainage channel, when actually it was the remains of an uplifted ancient river, that flowed at a time when this hill was literally level with the ground adjacent to it, and evidence of this fact can still be seen today, in the river rocks still located all around this alluvial channel, which prove it was alluvial and not colluvial, which would have displayed much more sharper, more angular rocks. These are three perfectly worn down and smooth rocks that I got from the area and brought back home which proved that an ancient river once flowed through here. As you can see, they are very rounded in their shape, proving this area was the site of an ancient waterway that was an important feature to the primordial landscape and wasn't just a minor creek or small gully. So I'd bet this area had some damn good gold and the lads that worked around here probably cleaned up well. But the description of a spiral ridge of rocks was something that always stood out to me when I read these accounts. Why was there a spiral ridge? How did it form? But now it's clear to me that this spiral was a result of the erosion resistant quartz reefs remaining whilst the surrounding less erosion resistant sedimentary and volcanic rocks got broken and worn down around it, and carried away over time. Leaving what was once an incredible feature, that was mined, and the remains of it no longer exist unfortunately. This Horst and Graben action more than likely depressed the many deep leads that would inevitably be mined at a depth of several hundred feet during the gold rush. Unsurprisingly, this form of mining was ridiculously dangerous, and it's also more than likely why Ballarat has a significant amount of erosion, with it being insanely gold rich, but containing gold reefs that are actually pretty low yielding per ton, which is perhaps unsurprising to anyone who watched the previous video that I made on this, which explained this phenomenon. Link to that in the description. And all of this has occurred because this landscape has been continually uplifted, and is located at the very top of the Great Dividing Range in this part of the land and the higher a mountain rises, the more pronounced the rate of erosion will be. So today, this mighty hill has almost no indications aside from these water-worn rocks that a flowing river tore through here. But when the early observations of this place were noted, it invariably shows the fact that this was indeed the place where an ancient river flowed eons ago, during a time when Victoria was a very different place, well before the deep leads, which in themselves are ancient enough. But who knows how long it existed here, and what existed before it. But those days are all gone now, 
And all we have is this incredible mountain range today, and the old accounts of those that once trekked through here, and initially observed it in its original pre-mining state, all of whom have since passed. Thanks for watching.